This is Journalist Hangout on Sunday, and we have joining us is the Executive Governor of Benue State, that's Governor Samuel Yotom. Thank you for joining us, sir. Okay. Yes. Uh... This year, you made a call to the U.S. Embassy on the nagging security issues in Nigeria, most especially about the former header clash. In your uh, presentation, you said you wanted them to know the facts about insecurity in Benue and Nigeria. Do you think that could throw up a significant solution to the ravaging insecurity in your state and Nigeria? Thank you very much. I have now heard the last part of your uh, question. Okay. Uh, but let me commend Ayo, who is the anchor of the program, Babajide, and my brother, uh, who is there with us. And to thank you for providing this opportunity for me, uh, someone uh, on ground to be able to clarify certain issues that borders my own state, and of course our country, Nigeria. I want to thank you very much. The TVC family, I want to commend you for living up to the expectation as a fourth reign of uh, governance. Uh, you have stood between the people and government, and so that clearly distinguishes you and you are deeply appreciated. You. Yes, uh, I made uh, a trip to the United Kingdom and also to the United States of America to talk about my own side of the story. Because before now, several uh, facts have been distorted and uh, different narratives were sent out there in the name of trying to vilify some of us who are spoken and who have stood and said the truth about the happenings in our country, Nigeria, and at least in Benue State where I preside as governor. And this was confirmed because when I spoke to the uh, United Kingdom civil societies and NGOs who are, were very concerned about the happenings in Nigeria and went to the parliament and met lords and also parliamentary uh, terrier members and we discussed. And they say that the impression they had was it's about farmers, headers, clashes back home in Nigeria. And largely because of uh, deforestation and then climate change and other factors. But no one was able to talk about the real issue on ground in Nigeria. It is not a hidden fact. I went to America. I spoke to parliamentarian, I spoke to civil societies and other NGOs that are greatly concerned about the happenings in Nigeria. Some of them are even Nigerians. And in one of my outings with a, seven, a certain advocacy and civil society group, I was told that the uh, crisis in Nigeria is not really about any other thing, but it's about deforestation, about climate change, about other factors that have led the people in the Sahel and the Fulanese indigenous to move into Nigeria. Thank God I was on ground. And one particular man who was commissioned to come and look for facts about the happenings in Nigeria. It was disgusting, and I told him, I did not hide it from him. He told us and the audience that the problem in Nigeria is about uh, issues of uh, deforestation and climate change that has led to that. And he came to Benue State. He came to Nigeria on a fact-finding mission. It was amazing that he told us that he came to Abuja 
and went to Kano and went to Lagos. Kano, Lagos, and Abuja are not the places where we have these flashpoints. I would have expected him to tell me that he went to Southern Kaduna, he went to Benue State, he went to Zamfara, he went to other places. And I rebooked him. Thank God the following day he confirmed to me and apologized to me that he got his facts wrong. And so my trip to the United Kingdom and the United States of America was to tell the people that the narrative that is being sent to them is a wrong one. The Fulanese have come here to take over Nigeria as their country. And I want to correct an impression. When I talk about the Fulanese, we have indigenous people who are here with us. We have no problem with them. But these Fulanese that are attacking us are from Niger, they are from Mali, they are from Chad, they are from Cameroon, they are from Senegal, they are from uh, Mauritania, they are from Libya and other parts of the world. But they decided that they will take over our country, Nigeria, to become a Fulani nation. Whether you like it or not, this is a fact. And this is what these people are doing. Any other thing they are bringing is false. Even the issue of religion that they are trying to bring to say to Islam, yes, it Mr. is Governor, true. We the would like you to be of, very careful at the ch your choice of words. You know, it's going to be very difficult to conclude here that some certain people. So we want you to be very, very circumspect because when you say for the full and ease, get it? That is why it will be a logical fallacy for me to say that the your, entire uh, Your Excellency, sir. I'm not talking about them. After that is why the, I had to distinguish after it. After the dastardly Sunday morning attack in the Gama, you suggested that the people may have to resort to self-defense. My question is, um, in the aftermath of the Sunday morning attack on Igama, you suggested that the people may have to resort to self-defense. And I'm asking you, uh, do you honestly think at this point that self-defense can help us to solve this problem, given the fact that the aggressors are very well and better harmed than our people? Okay. Th thank you very much. You all... I couldn't hear your last comment, but I think the main thrust of your question is captured by me, so I can respond. Yes, I did say. And the reasons are that self-defense is the first law of nature. You cannot continue to stay aloof. You cannot continue to wait for people to come and kill you without you making some minimum effort to defend yourself. It is natural that everybody will have to do that. And I tell you, as a student of the Bible, as a Christian, there is nowhere, just like my father in the Lord, Papa Debo, you said, there is nowhere in the scriptures where they say you cannot defend yourself. You must defend yourself. If you die in the process, that is it. And the point is, I am saying that we cannot allow impunity to continue in the manner that is happening in our country. What law is backing the Fulani bandits and the herdsmen, the so-called herdsmen? What law is backing them to have AK-47, AK-49, uh, destroy people's homes, kill people, man people, rape our women, rape our children, and drive them out of their homes and make them IDPs? What law backs them? So if there is lawlessness, lawlessness has already started. We have it in Nigeria. There is no government in Nigeria. And so why should I fold my hands and wait? And so I have asked my people to defend themselves, and that is what we're doing. Your Excellency, uh, you said there is no government in Nigeria. Tell us the truth. Is the federal government doing anything to help fight these farmer headers, incessant clashes in your state? How I wish that they will be here, it will be an interactive forum where federal government, the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs, that have been set up in place that they are stealing money and nobody is able to say anything. What have they done? 
ask them what they have given to the close to 2 million RDPs in Benue State. What have they given? Nothing. Peanuts. You have over uh, close to 2 million. Benue State population by projection is about 7 million people. And we have 2 million in IDPs. What have the federal government done? If not for the effort of the state government, spirited individuals, faith-based organizations, and other good humanitarian people who have come to our aid. We have even been denied international support. Tell me the USA that have been sending billions of naira to uh, uh, Nigeria for IDPs. What have come to Benue State? It goes to the Northeast. Tell me, even when the Vice President came to Benue State and saw the pains that I and the people of Benue State are going through, and even the IDPs, because we went to the camp, one of the camps, uh, two of the camps, we went there, and he promised that 10 billion was going to be made available. How many years? About four years now. Nothing has come from that promise to Benue State. So mm. tell me, which government two million be, people it, will be concerned that you have your people in IDPs? IDPs in Benue State? How are you coping with these growing numbers? And what is the effect on the economy of your state? It's, it's, it's not an easy tax. I've been suffering with this. My local government contributes, the state government contributes, faith-based organizations contribute, and all that just to keep the people going on. But I tell you that the situation is a terrible one. I don't pray that any other state you have this kind of situation that we're in in Benway State. The truth is that it is not easy. The IDPs themselves, they are not staying in standard IDP camps. They are staying in primary schools that were not meant for IDP camps. The children who are supposed to be going to school are not going there. Those who came as IDPs are not going to school. This is a situation. It's a terrible situation that I continue to call on spirited individuals, goodwill people, those who are humanitarian, should look at the plight that we have in Benue State. Government of Benue State alone cannot do it. Can you imagine? Benue State is an agrarian state. It is the food basket of the nation. We produce food. And most of the, more than 80% of the production of food in Benue State are done by peasant farmers. And a peasant farmer, one person, we have four, five, six, seven wives. And now you are forced by the activities of Fulani Hillsmen to be confined in an IDP camp with your 40 children or 10 children, with your seven or four or five wives, you're staying there. Where is your privacy? What do you do? And the economic impact on uh, Benue said, I tell you, it is huge. We have lost so much. The homes are no longer there. And even those who are in IDPs who are tempted to go back to their ancestral home, they have been killed every day. I have refused to continue to talk about the killings every day because I have said it for how many years? I have not seen any help. So I have decided to be quiet. Each time it happens, we have the burden of going to bury them. But I tell you that gradually there is famine in the land. Today there is no food because in those days, the civil servants, which are the servants who drive the economy, used to go to their villages to bring food to where they are serving. But today, the average farmer is coming to them or they are visiting IDPs or those who are seen somewhere that is safe are still coming to the civil servants to collect uh, money for food and their basic needs in life. So it is completely uh, a situation that uh, is out of place. Benway State is in pain. We are suffering. And I am not a happy man living in this kind of uh, situation. And I tell you, as the food basket of the nation, gradually, those who think that they are in safe lands, they will soon begin to feel the impact of what we are having. Because the farmers who used to produce 80% of the food that were called the food basket of the nation are no longer there. And they can't go to the farm and, and nothing is happening. So this is the situation. Economically, it has, this crisis has impacted negatively 
on Benue people. Okay, now let's uh, digress now to politics. Uh, how is your party dealing with the crisis of confidence between the party's presidential standard bearer, um, Atiku Abaka, and the governor of River State, your friend, uh, Isom Ezenwowike? I, I think th this is something that uh, I have been at the center of it because that is my friend. My party is PDP, and I remain a PDP member. But I tell you the truth, I have told the management and the leadership of our party that they have not done well, especially with my friend, Wiki, who is a pillar of PDP in Nigeria today. Myself, in 2015, when things did not go well, I left PDP for APC and won the election. But when I saw that APC were not ready to abide by the code of conduct and the oath of office that they took, I left back again, and Wiki was the one that facilitated. I am aware that the current national chairman himself, at a point he was not satisfied with the activities of the party, he left, but came back to PDP. And I'm also aware that even our presidential candidate left PDP for other parties, but came back. But Wike was the sole person that stood. You recall that Obasanjo had to disengage himself from partisan politics after he left office. Our former president, whom I served as my leader, as a minister under his tenure, President Jonathan, also decided to step aside, uh, at least for PDP. And so Wike was the anchor person. Yes, he contested for presidency. It did not work. He, some of us pleaded and worked for him to become the running mate. It did not work. But I think Wiki would have been placated. Wiki would have been reached out to and told to accept it that the PDP remains the platform and we must all work on it to do. That has not been done. And well, it's taking too long. Your Excellency, that is my challenge because that he has said that it's not going for the position of the vice presidency. Now, as in, if River State Governor is still bitter about what happened, do you think this would not adversely affect Article's uh, chances in winning in the 2023 presidential election? No, I, I, I think uh, the good news I have is that Article himself. The leadership of the party have accepted to intervene and reach out to Governor Wiki and the rest of the people that were aggrieved as a result of Wiki losing out. It is not late. But what I'm saying is that our people say, when you allow water to remain in your mouth for too long, hmm. it becomes saliva. <laughs> so I, I think that the earlier they reach out and sort these things out, we're a big family or PDP, these things can be sorted out and it will all be resolved and we move forward because we are looking at the larger interests of not just we as individuals, we are looking at the larger interest of our party and we are looking at the larger interest of Nigerians who are distressed as a result of bad governors and what is happening today in our country. Yes, and so I believe that once the leadership is able to reach out, we will be able to do that. Your Excellency, do you honestly believe that yes. the APC can be upstaged by the PDP in 2023 general election? Well, look, let me tell you, I'm a student of the Bible. John 3, 27 says that a man can receive nothing except is given to him from above. Mm -hmm. It implies that no party can receive anything if God does not design. So 
it, 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 whether PDP or APC or any other party, if God decides that this is it, it will be done. But you will agree with me that Nigerians are in distress. They have cried to God. And I believe that God is a God of justice. God is a God of equity. God is a God of, a God of uh, fairness. So he has heard the prayers of Nigerians. And this, what is happening in Nigeria today, cannot continue economically, security-wide, social life. Who will tell you in Nigeria today that is happy? Mm. Everything has fallen apart. And some of us who believe in prayers, we are praying to God that God should do away with this evil government that is in place. This government is evil. You will not like to hear that, but I want to tell you that yes, yes. this government yes, yes. is evil. And God we hear our prayers. The downtrodden masses, the blood of those people who have been killed in Benue State, who have been killed in Kaduna, who have been killed in Zamfara, who have been killed in Sokoto just now. I heard that 28 people were killed in Sokoto. This is not good enough. If the blood of one person in the beginning of the earth that his brother killed him and his blood cried unto God, how about the thousand in Benue State alone? We have over 5,000 people that have been killed from 2017 to date. I believe that God, who reigns in the affairs of man, will hear us and will definitely redeem us. And we cannot continue in this way. So a miracle can happen. Yes, even if uh, PDP is in opposition, it doesn't matter. Yes, APC can control. God can change the heart of those people who are in APC to even vote for PDP and make sure that this government do not continue. Okay, uh, Excellency, Benue State is blessed with abundant natural resources and has the capacity to feed at least 50% of the Nigerian population. What is the state doing to tap into the opportunities that abound in agriculture where revenue can be generated? Thank you very much. You see, when we came in in 2015, and even before 2015, one of the key points that we raised, our objective in governance was to ensure that we promote agriculture because that is where we have advantage. That is where we have value advantage. And we have done so well in promoting that. If not for the uh, Fulani Hillsmen attack in trying to destroy us and make sure that we're displaced. Benue State would have risen very high in terms of agricultural production in Nigeria because more than 98% of our land is arable. And we have two rivers, River Kasnala, River Benue. And so even we can do all year round uh, uh, farming activities. And this was what we have planned to do. And this was going on. And secondly, we have deliberately said that, look, having the background of a former minister of industry, trade, and investment, when I came in in 2015, one of the deliberate policies we put in place was to ensure that we, pro uh, we do not just produce uh, primary produce, but we go into processing. Because when you go into processing, you're providing jobs, you're creating wealth, you're providing opportunities for your people. And this was what we set up to do. And we provided the enabling environment. We have an industrial layout, we re-energize it, provided electricity, uh, resuscitated the roads that were there. Uh, we are ready to accommodate investors. We went out to China, to Asia, to America, uh, to other parts of the world to ensure that they bring in industries that can take advantage of the primary produce that we have and the raw materials we have in Benue State and make sure that they produce. And that we had anticipated that a lot of things will happen. But unfortunately, this issue of Hairsmen from I inherited it, it has started and it has continued to be a problem. But we know and we believe that the way to go is to industrialize and add value to the uh, primary agricultural produce. 
using them as raw materials so that jobs will be created, opportunities will be created, and wealth will be created. And Black that is what we're doing, despite all the challenges we have. Okay. Mr. Governor, you can tell us what you have done to significantly improve infrastructure in your state, beginning from with roads. Yes. Even with all the challenges I have, I knew that it was important that I put in place basic infrastructure that will help develop our people and be attractive to uh, foreign direct investment and bring even national investment to uh, their country. If you go to Makudi today, Makudi is wearing a new face. A lot of new openings in terms of road infrastructure, infrastructure have been done. If you go to Boko, if you go to Kasindala, if you go to Otupo, you will see the impact of this present government in place. And we're not just looking at uh, road infrastructure. We are looking at other areas. Health-wise, we have been able to provide facilities that will help our people because if you live a healthy life, you can do more things. If you talk about um, uh, other areas in improving governance, these two we have been able to do with our people. If you reach out to uh, uh, administration of land, we have taken steps to improve on the fortunes of land administration in Benue State. If you look at uh, agriculture, we've been able to provide facilities that will help improve on the agriculture and all that. So in all spheres of life, we've been able to improve on and make sure that uh, we, 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 we add value to development based on the uh, limited resources that we have. And so we, we, we appreciate God for all that we've been, done, we've been doing. And that is why the people of Benue State were appreciative in 2019. They renewed my mandate. So those people who say that Otom oh, have not even built a toilet, come to Benue State and talk about that. I can be publicity shy. US Maybe elect. because of the huge sums US that elect. is involved in making publicity. I don't have it. Yeah. So I prefer to use it to build uh, covert or drainage or whatever. Yes, let's see. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Let's not talk about human capacity. Let's talk about workers' welfare relative to the wage bill of your state. What are you doing with, the, with respect to workers' salary, pensions, and all that? And most importantly, the pressure we get on social media is that you don't pay salary. We need you to clear this air. Right? This air. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think this is a fallacy from my opponents. <laughs> this is a fallacy from my opponents who say that oh, don't, don't pay salary. If I had not been paying salary, at least you would have seen the reaction from the workers themselves. The truth is that in Benue State, there is a challenge. During a period of time, I will take you back to 1979 to 1983. For one year, the civil service were shut. The teachers did not go to work because of this issue of salaries and emoluments and all that. During Akume's time, during the military and then Akume's time, the issue was still there. And during the uh, Susan's administration, the issue did not subside. We've been having this problem. It has been there. So when I came in in 2015, I inherited over 70 billion arrears of salaries, pension, and gratuity. This is what I've been trying to solve. We've been able to reduce. Today, we have less than 40 billion that is outstanding to pay at the state level. At the local government, we have less than 25 billion that is outstanding. And you will recall that there is no state they can do this. I have accumulated this over the years. In 2017, I said that, look, let me draw a line. So in 2017, workers at the state level were owing them five months. Workers at the uh, local government level and teachers, uh, teachers is 10 months, and uh, local government is uh, nine months. I drew a line and started paying. As of today, I can account that from 20, 
in team, first of January, have been able to pay salaries up to date until we started having some problems in the economy, which everybody is aware of, which is not just peculiar to me, but to all the states. Over 30 states are having the same uh, problem. As had, when we started having this problem, the issue has been that uh, for two months, I am owing, but as soon as money comes in, I pay. Even this month, we are going to pay salaries to workers. But let me tell you, one strategy I have adopted, which has paid off and it's has helped me, is to allow the civil service union to be part of the allocation committee. So what comes from the federal government, what comes from the IGR, what comes to the local government, the civil servants, the pensioners, the, the pensioners are also aware of how much comes. And how we appropriate it, they are also part of it. That is why I have not had any serious crisis when it comes to the issue of uh, revolt against me about pension. We have been paying. If I have not been paying, how will workers uh, really uh, fund themselves? But the truth is that there are problems in the economy today. NNPC are no longer remitting to the Federation account. And it has been a huge challenge to all the states in our country today. And I tell you, we'll continue to do our best. I have nothing to hide. And if anybody knows that we have taken money or diverted salaries or anything, I challenge them to bring it up. But if you tell lies, I will take you to court. <laughs> no, no, I, I want to know, between 2018 and now, how many months' salary are you owing, sir? Between two months, you are as I two told months. you, it is just a two months. I have been able to clear the salaries of April, the, that of May and uh, June. I'm here to clear, but I can assure you there was a little improvement on the allocation for Both. this month. Yes. And I'm, I'm willing uh, because I prioritize the issue of payment of salaries because Benway, service, Benway State is a state that the economy is driven by peasant farmers and actively uh, uh, contributed by the civil service. So when you don't pay salaries, there's a problem. Is so I'm aware of this. With this. I have never told with issues of service. salaries. Yes. Pardon? Is it true that you have the highest number of civil servants in your states? Well, it, it has to be that because we don't have... We, have, we don't have industries like other states do. And so the industry we have is civil servants. And so you <laughs> just have to do employment. Some because you want them to be engaged. You don't want the use to just be floating. Every year we have Benway State University. We have a University of Agriculture. We have other tertiary institutions. So every year you have thousands of uh, our children graduating, and sometimes you want to engage them. But let me tell you, many people may not be aware of this. Benway State is paying the highest salary in the North. Take your statistics, compare with any other state in, Niger in, in the Northern Nigeria. In Nigeria, Benway State is paying uh, the highest salary after Lagos and River State. This is the truth, and this is what on ground. But we have decided because inflation and several other factors have contributed. You can't talk about even reducing the salary. You can't do that because I go to the market and I know what the cost of life, cost of uh, goods and materials uh, is in our country today. So there is no way I can talk about reducing uh, the salaries of these people. That is what I inherited, but I accepted it to be. And this matter is not peculiar to me. Yes, opposition can go and say anything they want, but it has been in existence. I inherited it. Uh, it wasn't uh, Akume that accumulated it from uh, Periku to Akume, to Suswam, to myself, where we are now. But one thing I have adopted, which no other state uh, uh, government have done, is to ensure that I involve the civil service union into this matter. And again, let me tell you, in my attempt to try to find 
a lasting solution to the issue of pension and gratuity. I have domesticated the Pencon law. Today, we have contributed money to Pencon to the tune of over five billion naira. Recently, Pencon came up with a report, and Benue said was amongst the five states what, that was uh, said to be diligent and paying this money. I believe that at the appropriate time, we were able to reach okay. a certain uh, benchmark That's with Pencon after pay. We will borrow money from there and clear the areas that is existing. And I think this is the idea. This is the first time that a government in Benue State have made attempt to solve the issue of pensions and gratuity. And All that right. is what Mr. I'm Gobo, doing. We have to have there. Time is fast spent. Yeah. I want to thank you. I want to thank, thank you for you. your time. Thank you so much for your time. BQ. Yes, um, Vintage uh, Samuel Otom speaks his mind all the time. Mm. That's, that's the governor of Benue State that we know. Mm. Uh, so, hopefully, so we'll have an opportunity to talk to him again. Yeah, mm. the, uh, the, the interesting part of uh, it for me is where he mentioned he paid one of the highest um, mm. salary yes. in, 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 yeah, in I the I thought it was I had known that. I thought it was the number. Yeah. I didn't know. I, didn't that, know. Uh, no, I, had, known, I had known for a long time that no. Benue. Mm is one of the five states paying the highest salary in our country, that is the highest wage bill. That mm. is that that's, that's, part of, part, that's part of what created the problem. problem for, mm. Uh, mm.